Good morning. Welcome to the Genghis Weekly Investor Briefing. Today is November 16th, the 47th week of 2020, and there are still investment opportunities to be captured. My name is Damaris, and I'm the Marketing and Communications Manager at Genghis Capital. The Genghis Weekly Investor Briefing is a weekly webinar courtesy of our research department and a special weekly guest speaker. The aim of the briefing is to equip you with financial market information and trading insights to allow you to make prudent investment decisions in the coming week. We like to call it taking the guesswork out of investing. Shortly, I'll be joined by two colleagues, Gerald, who's a research analyst with a focus on equities. Gerald will let us know about the happenings on the stock exchange and of listed companies. He'll share with us any upcoming corporate actions, as well as a helpful trading recommendation segment on specific counters. His presentation will be followed by Churchill's, who will brief us on the microeconomic space in Kenya, as well as the opportunities and development in fixed income, that is treasury bills and bonds. This week, we are honored to once again have Matthew Kabire of FX Pesa join the Genghis Briefing. Matthew is a leading specialist from Genghis's strategic partner, that is FX Pesa EGM Securities. He will, be, he will be broadening our horizons of opportunities against global financial markets. Genghis CDS clients have a unique access to FX Pesa products, which allows them to, to diversify their investments by trading global financial assets that include international stocks like Zoom, Facebook, and Apple, as well as other financial instruments. We are, as always, really looking forward to Matthew's weekly brief. The webinar is interactive. We encourage all our attendees and guests to talk to our panelists of experts using the Q section or to drop a comment in the chat function. Very excited to begin. Gerald, over to you. So uh, to begin with the recap of uh, what happened in the markets last week, um, fairly, some fairly bullish activity uh, with the Nasi up about 1.8% and then the C20 about 1.1%. So I think uh, when we go to the next slide, you'll see that uh, most of the markets, uh, not just uh, in Kenya, but in Africa generally and also globally, lost quite some bullish activity and I think this followed the announcement of a vaccine or a fairly effective vaccine. They, they talked about a 90% effective rate. So I think that was one of the key that uh, moved the markets last week. So, uh, however, uh, in our market, turnover was down to about 2.1 billion. That is about 33% uh, down. That was below the recent uh, week's averages. We usually see turnover of 3 billion and 4 billion. So, um, so Tanovo definitely was a bit uh, a bit uh, lower uh, as much as the market uh, was moving upwards in terms of the indices. So top, top gainers last week, uh, Samia, Crown, Kenyari, and the ABR. And then the losers, we had uh, Kabasi, Portland, uh, Total, and uh, Total Kenya. So uh, in terms of foreign activity participation, 53%, I think the previous week we were at about 68%. So a lot of activity from the local end. And then uh, in terms of foreign flows, you're seeing a lot of, uh, a lot of buying activity, which has sustained for quite a number of weeks so far on Safaricom. There's still some very bullish activity from foreign and about Safaricom. I think this followed uh, the <clears throat> half year results, which was, uh, I think, uh, despite being neg negative growth, I think was quite resilient. Uh, there were some segments of the business that were quite, uh, that performed quite strongly despite uh, the pandemic. So um, top traded, uh, the usual Safaricom, KCB, PTNB, basically the stocks that usually have the biggest fundamentals and uh, tend to be a part performance in terms of ROE and also uh, growth in the bottom line. Um, uh, where we are trading at, um, uh, currently last week, uh, if you look at the third column week on week, uh, some quite positive performance from across uh, the SSC markets, I think there was uh, th that effect of a uh, fairly effective vaccine that was announced. Um, to look at PE, our market PE is about 10.1, uh, uh, slightly above uh, where the African average is at 8.7 times. And the dividend is basically at about uh, where the market, the average African average, where the African average is. So fairly a balanced market compared to where our peers in SSC are trading at. Um, trading ideas for the week, 
Uh, still, uh, longer term, uh, longer term, we are biased towards the strong stocks that have the biggest fundamentals. I think you have mentioned this. Our market is trading at uh, multi-year low levels, and uh, most of the stocks, except Safaricom, are trading at uh, very discounted levels, including KCB, BAT, ABL, um, you know, and the banks generally. Um, but in terms of this week, uh, we are, we are, our eyes are keen on Kenya. We have seen some price weakness, I think, just today at about five shillings level. And this is uh, despite, um, you know, some positive performance that is expected for full year up to, up to June uh, 2020. We've seen some numbers saying about uh, profit after tax of about 10.5 billion shillings. But uh, this is a record uh, level of, of profitability for Kenjan. But you note that there is a tax credit of about 1.9 billion. So if you remove that, uh, tax credit of about 1.9 billion. Uh, you get a normalized uh, profit of the tax of about a growth of about 7.5 percent, which is uh, quite solid and quite good for most uh, for financial year that is uh, basically bad for most of the companies. So um, I think why why uh, investors are very much concerned and uh, you know this weakness in the prices is about cash flow. Yeah, definitely there's going to be challenges in terms of cash flow for the business. You know that KPLC has been struggling this year and also in the previous years. So they usually have challenges in terms of payment and this could, uh, could impact the business. However, the fundamentals of, of the business Kenyan are still quite, uh, quite solid and it's a stock that we like. Um, on the other end, uh, we are looking at a starter group. Uh, we are urging investors to take some profit. I think so far this quarter, the fourth quarter, uh, the stock has gained about 35.7%. That is in a, in a span of about six weeks. So investors who got in at, at those low price levels, when it was about 18 shillings and below, then they can look into locking that 35.7% uh, and cash out from the stock. Um, in terms of corporate calendar, uh, the banks, the banking sector has a, a deadline of um, 30th of November to announce their results. And from what we have, we have seen from uh, both Equity Bank and, uh, and KCB Group, uh, is definitely a decline in profitability across the board. Uh, as, we, as we saw in half year, I think it was more of a mirror of what happened in half year results. So we, are, we definitely expect uh, what most of the banks announced uh, uh, in half year to, to be similar to what uh, they will announce in 3Q results. So for KCB, I think, uh, Performance was quite depressed, uh, 43, about 43% decline in profitability. And then this, uh, this was uh, mainly because of provisions. Provisions increased quite substantially compared uh, to where they were in, uh, in last year, similar period in last year. Equity Bank, a similar, similar thing, over 600% increase in, uh, in provisioning levels, and then uh, their bottom line declined about 13%. So it's expected to be, to be what is uh, to be the, the weakness is expected to uh, to be observed across uh, the other banks as they uh, announce their financial results. Um, Chacho could take us uh, from there on the macro and fixed income. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Gerald, for that wonderful presentation on the equity segment. Uh, before I get into my section, I would also like to congratulate you on the Safaricom earnings expectations uh, for our participants. Uh, Jengis published its uh, Safaricom pre-earnings and valuations update that was on the 30th of October. That was two weeks ago on a Friday. And then last week on Monday, the earnings that came from Safaricom were more or less in line with what Gerald who penned that note had expected, be it uh, the earnings per share, our expectation was around uh, 0 0.82 cents. It came at 83 cents, and also the drop in M-Pesa growth, 14.8 percent, 14.8 percent expectation, and what came out eventually was 14.5 percent. So that's really generally you set yourself apart uh, in terms of uh, Safaricom coverage. And for once, I know that uh, Damaris should uh, treat you out. So just keep yeah. just keep yeah. on that. Yeah. Anyway, let me get to more serious. Let me just move to the serious presentation. 
So let's start with the macroeconomic view. Just a moment, let me just, just a moment. Yeah, I'll start with last week's macroeconomic review. I'll start with the quarterly economic and budgetary review reports. Uh, this report is usually put out for five days at the end of the quarter. So Treasury put it out on Friday. Uh, on Friday, exactly. Yes. So ideally, it's just a rear view mirror at what uh, the first quarter. By first quarter is in terms of the financial year's calendar, financial year, which starts between July up until September. So that was the review of uh, the budget during that period. Ideally, we had seen uh, the ordinary revenue numbers uh, on a monthly basis uh, within 21 days at the end of each month. Treasury puts it puts up the some of these numbers, excluding appropriation in aid, excluding external grants within the Kenya Gazette issues, and uh, we had seen even the numbers for ordinary revenue came about uh, 342.6 billion. That is as per the Kenya Gazette, and we had estimated the target to be around 382.8 billion. So it was well within target. Uh, the actual target that Treasury was eyeing in that quarter was 384.3 billion. If, of course, it's a no-brainer that uh, COVID-19 has impacted negatively on all the tax streams, be it uh, income tax, be it, uh, be it VAT, be it uh, import duty, and other revenue stream, streams. Uh, so that will play out quite uh, in line with the expectation. The only surprising bit was now the corporate income tax, which uh, came out better than expected. So that's something that... Uh, took us by a surprise. Uh, proportion in aid is basically uh, the internal generated revenue and also the railway development levy uh, came in quite pretty well, better than expectation at 36.1 billion against 44.6 billion. Uh, overall, we are seeing total revenue and external grants at 32.6 billion against 437.13 billion that uh, the government had expected to collect in that quarter. Moving on to the expenditure side of the equation, um, overall total expenditure was 510 billion against 567 billion. Uh, in terms of uh, national government uh, recurrent expenditures, that's the wages and salaries, and also the operations and maintenance, we saw uh, slightly lower than expected at 215.6 billion. Uh, interest payments, uh, that's uh, both on the domestic and foreign, foreign uh, payments, uh, it's slightly higher than what the treasury, what treasury had expected at 115.3 billion against 114.3 billion. Uh, so in total, the consolidated fund service, ideally, this is a fast charge on, on the consolidated fund uh, uh, coming in pretty Pretty much within expectations, 141.5 billion against 145.6 billion. Of course, no brainer here. Uh, county governments underperformed in the quarter just because of the protracted legislative process to get into County Allocation Revenue Act. Uh, so, we, in line with, as seen in those numbers, 228.8 billion against 65 billion. What came by surprise was national government, now the development expenditure. It came out pretty strong at 122 billion against 90 billion that was expected. This was basically due to some of the development projects uh, that were embarked in the quarter, uh, particularly that were funded by the donors. Uh, now uh, from expenditure and the revenue, now we move to the financing bit. How do we, the, the, the difference between revenue uh, that had been collected now to fund the expenditure side. Overall, we're seeing uh, 129 or rather 130 billion as the total financing costs. Uh, uh, in terms of uh, net foreign, foreign financing, it, it was actually the repayments uh, dominated basically due to the debt uh, principal repayments to the tune of 47.4 billion in that quarter against something to the tune of 24.6 billion in terms of what was disbursed by, for, by, by foreign foreign agencies. Uh, just a quick, uh, a quick math between now the, the total 
debt financing in the quarter came to around 80 billion. We have the debt uh, principal, that's the 47.4 billion. And then we had also the interest payments, uh, which I showed you in the previous screen, which was around 34.4 billion. So in total, we are seeing uh, uh, close to 80 billion uh, was uh, paid out in terms of servicing the debt. And that's quite uh, uh, a big number in light that uh, in the quarter between in the quarter between July and September there's a drop in uh, foreign foreign 122 billion so that partly explains the drop in FX reserves during that quarter of course there are some other additional uh, items that came to fund to support the uh, FX reserves but the point I'm trying to bring is uh, external debt servicing accounts for a larger aspect of the dip in uh, FX reserves at any given point. Uh, looking on to net domestic financing, uh, the total aggregate, basically this is coming from central bank, uh, coming from the banks, coming from the non-banks and, uh, and the foreign uh, holders of domestic, foreign holders of domestic debt. In aggregate, this number was 152.4 billion. And what came out quite strong is that banks uh, contributed uh, around 158 billion in terms of financing, be it uh, treasury bills, be it the fixed rate bonds and the infrastructure bonds, 158 billion. We are starting to see the numbers as Gerald has mentioned uh, from the banking sector, the third quarter earnings and what has come out even from the banks that have released that there was a big jump in uh, accumulated uh, government securities within that quarter and we also expect that even the other banks that will be should be announcing in the next from today up until end of next week we'll see a big jump in uh, the government securities accumulation in the quarter of course uh, that negates the private sector credit growth which uh, as we are meant to understand is at 7.6 percent as at the end of september that's the 12 month period but just drilling down into those numbers, we don't see uh, a robust, uh, robust uh, credit, private sector credit mediation, whereby uh, we just did the math between April. Uh, that's when we were, we can say that officially we were in COVID-19 period up until September, whereby 105 billion uh, of the net private sector credit stock was was there but i think 76 billion was the one that actually went to support private sector credit growth so uh, what what the point i'm trying to bring is that we need to read whenever we see this private sector credit growth particularly within this covid covid 19 backdrop we just need to have some cautiousness in looking at those numbers uh, so that's the point i'm trying to bring across that banks still are risk averse to to lend to the private uh, sector rather to the real economy so they are playing it safe uh, getting into government securities moving on to the fixed income review for last week uh, we saw a big jump uh, 27.4 percent uh, to 9.6 billion total turnover secondary market but this is coming from a low base the previous week it was 7.7 billion and most of the trades that we saw last week being executed were on the infrastructure bonds and towards the tail end of the week that's on friday we saw uh, between short term to medium term papers that's papers whose maturity is 10 years and below which started picking up activity uh, towards the end of last week in terms of weekly t-bills overall uh, bids that were placed was 30.4 billion that represented a performance rate of 126.6%. Uh, basically, the, the T-bills also coincided with uh, the top seal that CBK had put uh, for a 25-year paper that was issued in October. So CBK wanted to, uh, CBK sought uh, 20 billion, but it managed to get 7.9 billion. So that's around 38% of the target that it sought from the market from this top sale. So ideally, just looking at the performance from T-bills, what we are reading from these numbers is that most investors are sticking to short-term uh, securities as opposed to getting it long, at least in the against the backdrop of the uncertain environment. 
that is playing out currently. Uh, looking at how the yields have trajectory of yields, you have seen that uh, from recent uh, lows, that's around mid-July, uh, they've bounced back as 0.67%. And from uh, October up until now, uh, it's bounced back by 0.35%, uh, the T-bills yields. Moving on to liquidity trends, uh, we saw that uh, Interbank uh, declined uh, 0.31% last week uh, to an average of 3.03%. Uh, basically, this is telling us that there was some improved liquidity in the market, and this was also supported by the buyers by CBK. On a daily basis, it just assesses the liquidity situation amongst the banks, and it was basically a mop up activities last week on three sessions, and it sat out on two sessions. It didn't even, it did not intervene on two sessions last week. That was on Wednesday and Friday. That said, it sold 75 billion, it received 48.6 billion, and accepted 46.2 billion. The weighted average rate was around 6.41%. Uh, and basically, the instruments that was used, this is the term auction deposits, was seven-day tenors. So you look at it, 6.41%, uh, uh, seven-day tenor, and you look at 91-day T-bill, it's 6.67%. So it was a no-brainer for some of the banks, at least to pack it in the short term uh, on, on, on these uh, TADS instruments, term auction deposits instruments, as opposed as they still weigh out the situation. There's still uh, the primary bond uh, sale that is still ongoing. So right now, uh, most banks are still uh, weighing the situation. And I'll get back to that. I'll get into that in uh, one of my subsequent slides. Uh, in terms of net domestic borrowing, uh, inclusive of overdraft facility, right now we are at uh, 244.9 billion. Uh, domestic borrowing that represents uh, close to 40% of the revised uh, borrowing target of uh, 600 billion. Uh, speaking of the revised borrowing target, 600 billion, we had uh, expected that there could be a supplementary budget that is stable in National Assembly. Uh, that, as it may be, we are saying that there could be a delay on that. And the reasoning behind that is that uh, there was a time high court, uh, October 29th, it nullified some of the laws that had been passed at the National Assembly without uh, input from the Senate. And it sort of jeopardized even uh, the legislative bills that were still in those two houses in the bicameral par parliament. So what happens is uh, be before any bill is stable in either of the houses, uh, both Senate, both speakers, they have to agree that this is this particular bill does not concern counties before they are given a go ahead either to be tabled in Senate and in National Assembly. Of course, there are those bills that which are concerning counties are tabled in both houses. There are others money bills which are table at the National Assembly. But right now, the import of that ruling is that some of these bills uh, had not had a uh, nod by the Senate, Senate. So most of these bills we noted affected the uh, supplementary appropriation bill between 2018 and 2017. So that somehow sort of uh, slows down even the legislative process towards the supplementary that had been preempted in the 2020 budget review outlook paper. So, but that's as it is right now, we know that the revised target for net domestic borrowing is 600 billion from 494.3 billion. Uh, finally, uh, week's trade, just looking at the primary bond each ones, uh, it's featuring a reopening of uh, long-term papers, uh, the 20, FXD2 2013-15, right now it has uh, 7.5 years uh, remaining uh, up until its maturity. It has a coupon rate of 12%. Implied yield, we, we interpolated the implied yield. Uh, we didn't get the last week's implied yield, but what we did from the yield curve, we just looked at the seven year yield uh, as given by NSC and the eight-year yield, and then we did interpolation to get what's the implied yield for this particular paper. So it came up to around 11.0882%. So our lower range bid is 10.7%, 10, 10 upper range bill is 
bid is 10.9 percent finally on the fxd1 2018 20 right now it has 7.4 years life remaining on that paper it's issuing a better coupon rate than the fxd2 2013 15 at 13.2 we interpolated similarly the implied yield at 12.74 percent. Lower range uh, recommendation is, is at 12.7 percent, and upper range recommendation is at 13.1 percent. Uh, so that's it. Let me pass on the button to Matthew. Uh, tell us what's happening on the global front. That uh, there's been uh, interest uh, coming from the U.S. fiscal stimulus. Any update from there? Anyway, Matthew, take it up from here. You may need to unmute. All right, thank you so much, Churchill. Um, there's, of course, a lot of things and a lot of questions and concerns about the stimulus and, of course, the US elections. So let me just touch a little bit on it. All right, so on the opportunity on the markets, of course, I will start with um, a few things just to give more knowledge about trading. And then after that, we move on to the, the week ahead and what has been happening. So I want to speak more about risk management tools and I uh, will still keep on insisting on the importance of managing your capital because that's what you have to trade. It, it's like, uh, even if you have all the skills and uh, you know how to trade, you will need money. You need to have capital in your, in your account. So if you can't protect your capital, if you can't manage that risk, because if you understand these markets are really risky, maybe a little bit difference between um, what uh, Gerald and Churchill are talking about is for the stocks, you might not see a very big jump all of a sudden, not, might, might, be not, might not be very volatile, but with Forex, it, it, you might see changes that are moving really, really fast and volatile. So risk management is very important. And um, real quick of the tools that you have, number one, make sure that um, you know how much you're risking per trade. When I say that, I mean, if you want to buy a Euro USD or sell gold or something like that, you need to, first of all, ask yourself, what percentage of my account or your capital or your equity are you risking in every one single trade? And a, a simple example is, if you have $100 in your account, let's say, for example, you might decide to risk in every trade 2%. So what you will do, you will calculate 2% of $100, if that's the amount you have, 2% of $100, if you get it to $2, then that's the amount that you should not allow yourself to lose in every single trade. So that you don't get uh, surprises that um, when you make a loss, you might make a bigger loss. So risk per trade, very important. Lot size or position sizing. Uh, there's something called lot size. That is the amount of contracts that you're buying or selling in the market. So but if you take a bigger lot, then you're likely, you're likely to get bigger Peep value, which means you be getting a bigger move, either in your favor or against your favor. So you need to take a position, you need to take a lot size that is really commensurate or is, um, is, is measures along with your account. There are ways you can do that, right? And uh, you, you might need to get into some course to understand because of course, uh, we have a little time here to check more on that, but position sizing is very important. Don't put a very big lot size, right? And that's part of addressing the, the problem of being greedy. Use a smaller lot size that is favorable and, and that's um, in agreement with your risk per trade that you're taking. Another very important thing, stop loss, right? Uh, just, I'll, I'll keep on giving this example that when you get your car, if you have a car, for example, when you get your car from your garage, for example, or where you've parked it, before you ignite, you know your destination, right? Before you, 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 you just go to the top speed and accelerate to 100 kph, yeah? You know you have enough brakes, brakes good enough to stop you, right? So stop loss is important to prevent you from making bigger losses, just in case the trade goes against you, because of course, you know, um, there's nothing which is guaranteed in the markets. And uh, it's a market which is not controlled by anyone. It's just purely by the global markets, move, uh, global economic issues and things like politics and social aspects. So you need to have stop loss and that will protect you from a bigger drawdown 
and you always know what you're expecting to lose in case the trade goes against you. But again, even as you're capping your losses, you need to have a target, right? You can't invest without knowing what you're doing, otherwise you'll be gambling, right? So you need to understand um, my stop loss will be around here. That's what you don't want to lose. Up to that point, you don't want to lose much more than that. But then when it comes, when the trade works your way, um, what are you targeting, right? And that one comes in terms of risk reward ratio, something that then you, you can get more when you uh, get into our training and um, much more on the videos that we've put online. Another very important thing you need to understand is leverage. Leverage has got the good side and the bad side of it. But of course, the advantages are there. All right. So one advantage is that it increases the amount that you can control in the market. That's where we are able to trade with a smaller capital. And um, a, a simple example is if you have, again, $100, that you have a leverage of 400 which FX Pesa EGM Securities offers as a default, but you can always change. It multiplies the amount that you can trade in the market. But when you're taking a position, for example, it, it helps you to open that position with a smaller capital requirement of your amount. If it's a, pos if it's a position that um, you wanted to trade the Euro USD and you wanted to buy, for example, uh, five, uh, five lots, you might have needed to use like $600,000 or something thereabouts. But again, if you factor in the leverage, it reduces that amount. So that instead of spending that large amount of money, Leverage comes in to reduce that amount of money. So um, leverage, again, use it well, all right? Because on the other side, it increases, it multiplies, um, it maximizes the moves. So that if you have a, a bigger leverage, then um, it, it has that effect of uh, giving you more profits if you're making profits or more losses if you're making losses. So it's a double-edged sword that you need to understand how to use it. Right, just the way you would have a knife in your in your house, if if you it, it helps you to cut your vegetables and prepare everything, but if you don't be careful and it just gets through your your finger, of course you understand the thing. So it's all about learning how to use it effectively. Another thing, don't get emotionally invested. That one means that risk what you can afford to lose. Yes, you can get profits in forex and even in stocks trading, but don't risk everything that you have. Take a percentage put it there and put in effective or if, uh, good uh, risk management strategies and tools. Again, something very important, find the right broker. And the right broker is a broker that is an undealing. An undealing broker is not interested on your profits or your losses. Their main function is just to make sure that they provide you the platform. And whenever you, you put uh, your orders to buy or to sell, it is just, um, straight to the uh, to the market right there's no kind of dealing on that order anywhere so an undealing broker is really very good and one of the ways of um, of uh, of course sieving out or filtering filtering out those type of brokers is looking at the brokers which are regulated by the uh, the local authorities here in Kenya the capital markets authority right so that's what I had to talk about today on the risk management tools. On the week ahead, last week we had um, global stocks skyrocketing, of course, uh, on Monday. Of course, uh, we had news about um, the likelihood of getting a coronavirus vaccine, of course, from the Pfizer and BioNTech. So it's been tested, and according to the news that we, we received, and what we have been reading is 90% effective, still waiting to see on how it's going to be. Last week, again, COVID-19 cases rising so much. Of course, uh, the President Trump um, announcing an executive order to ban US investors from holding shares on those companies, of course, related to the Chinese uh, military. Of course, you know, this, this, um, the, the, the Trump has, um, has always been having a banter with uh, China and that's what has been happening last week. Key events to watch this week, um, China industrial production, retail sales, um, US Empire State PMI, manufacturing index, very important. Again, on the Australian side, the monetary policy, US and uh, BOE, of course, Bank of England talking about uh, 
might be, might be talking about their stimulus or um, interest rates on Wednesday, UK, some news there, Canada and US, of course, on their building permits, very important. The building permits, of course, it's all about uh, the people who have acquired uh, new homes. So that's indicative of, um, a little bit indicative of how the economy is, is moving on. Thursday, Australian dollar there, of course, and US, European Central Bank, Christine Lagarde, be speaking there. On Friday, Canadian retail sales, and of course, UK. So these news are really important. Why do, why do we mention this? Because they will lead you to understand the assets that might be moving, right? Might be having a little bit higher volatility and that's where you find opportunities to trade. So products to watch, um, Dow Jones, the US 30, of course it surpassed its historical resistance level of 29,600 level and might go to 30,000 on the positive vaccine news, of course, uh, because it means that uh, people are going to rise up and start uh, if there's vaccine, of course, there will be less, less fears about the COVID and might lead even to uh, more appreciation of the of that uh, index. And of course, uh, fiscal stimulus is still in the offing. That, that's going to have a big effect on the US stocks. And of course, right now, it's trading along the 29,600 and you might see it if, if, if it retreats along that level, maybe to the 28,600. However, if it just breaks above the 29,600, my target levels of 30,000 um, 30, moving up. Let me check on the charts to just uh, show you that. Just a second. We'll look at it towards the end. The next one that we won't look at is Australian dollar USD. Of course, it's trading within the 07100 level, that range. And um, of course, it's about the simple moving average, 200 simple moving average. COVID-19 fears again in, in, taken in on the Australian dollar. And of course, the Australian China trade still very much affecting that um, the technicals of that uh, pair. So when you look at the moving averages, the bulls have it. It's like there's more strong buying sentiment. And of course, we've, um, if the Australian dollar break, uh, 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 breaks below the 07, uh, 100, if it trades below that level and breaks below the 6990, then of course, we're likely to see even a lower, lower move. So. If you can allow me to just go straight to those pairs and just have a look at it. Um, where is it, where is it, where is it, where is it? Just a second. All right, there we are on the US 30. So you see it is it is uh, just hit or checked the level of 29,600 there. If it breaks above that level upwards, we might see to the highs of above 30,000 and 31,500. And um, of course it's trading above the moving averages. So we are on an upward bias. If, if the fiscal stimulus comes in, of course, it might even have a bigger effect and you might see it, the stocks even soaring higher and higher. On the Australian dollar, you see it's just um, testing the level, it's testing the levels of uh, 7, 3, uh, 400 there. And uh, if it just breaks above that level, you might see it moving high even to test the 7, 4, 200 levels there. But if, it's, if it bounces and um, again gets below the moving averages, might go to test the, the month lows of uh, 69900. But currently, it's above the moving averages and um, it's a bullish outlook. So th that's my bit for now. Over to you, colleagues, Churchill, Gerald. 
Okay. Thank you so much, Matthew. As usual, that has been very insightful. So I think today's briefing was all encompassing. Gerald talked to us about the training recommendations for the week. We have Ken Jenny now our sites uh, with a buy recommendation. We have uh, a recommendation to take profit in standard group. And in addition, we know in the next two weeks, a lot of, or rather all the banking counters will be releasing their results. So that's something to look out on. And uh, we've gotten a couple of compliments to you, Gerald, uh, for your spot on analysis of Safaricom. So we expect more of the same. The bar has been set. <laughs> so thanks so much for that. Uh, Gerald, uh, there are those three open bonds. Thank you for that particular bit of information. And Matthew, I really do like how you first introduce us to different concepts of trading on the global market and then move on to the specific recommendations. Now, I'm going to start with Matthew today because there's quite a bit of chatter uh, regarding FX PESA. So if I move to the chat, um, I am seeing Beatrice and Catherine. So the first thing is that Beatrice wanted to know if there is a possibility of her, of us trading on her behalf because okay I don't know want to, I don't want to see that she's what she said a non financial mind, but I just think she feels she could get more value out of that. So on top of Beatrice's question on whether we could trade on her behalf, I do have Brian on Q and A who asked you Matthew, uh, what is FX Pesa risk to reward and does FX Pesa offer cryptocurrency? So. Could you tackle those, Matthew? Yeah, yeah, sure, I will. So thank you so much, Brian, for being here. We're really excited to engage with you. So um, risk to reward, you see, for FX Pesa, we are not dealing. We won't trade for you. I've, I've had that question, uh, speaking about that. So we won't trade for you. So when it comes to risk reward ratio, it's something that you set as a trader. So you want to, as, as you're placing your trade, you want to decide yourself whether the stop loss, which you, where you're putting your stop loss and the risk which you're taking, are you targeting um, a double of that? For example, if you're risking $10, are you targeting maybe $20 or $10 so that you have a, a risk reward ratio of one is to one? If the amount which you're risking is equal to the amount which you're targeting, or if you're targeting double what you're risking, that could be a risk reward of one is, is to two. So uh, we don't trade for, uh, for our clients. You trade for yourself. So we will train you and learn how to put how to target and how to do the risk reward ratio on your trades. So it's on your side. Thanks. Thanks for that. Okay. Brad. So, and Beatrice, I think Beatrice, you've gotten your question, um, an answer to your question. So Matthew, mm -hmm. the other question was about cryptocurrency, but maybe you could also address EK's question. He wanted to know about the Greek British pound and Japanese yen pairing, if you could comment on that. All right, so I will start with the crypto. For now, we're not offering crypto, right? We have uh, those financial assets on, um, we have stocks, we have uh, currency pairs, um, we have uh, metals like gold, platinum. So we have like five, six metals there. So for now, we're not offering cryptos, but uh, maybe to give you insights, when you're looking at the cryptos, the way they are represented on the charts, I think so, it's just using the same financial information. If you understand how to look at the charts and, um, analyze on the Forex bit, even on the cryptos, you can, might use the same information to analyze. What might be different is the fundamentals that affect the, the cryptos and of course, what affects um, the Forex side. And um, EK on the GPP, JPY, I have uh, not been checking on it, but let me just have a look on it in a few and I'll get back to you, it's okay. All right, cool. So Matthew, as you look that up, I can yeah. move on to Churchill. Churchill, you have a question from Justice Oguti. Justice is saying, um, there's a time that new projects had been suspended. Do you have an account of the projects that the increased funding went into? Is that something you could tackle? And then as you prepare to answer that, Gerald, you'll be up next with Ian's question. Ian is asking about growth investing versus value investing, which would be the best way to approach the stock market. But let's first start with Churchill. Uh, just for the question, uh, let me handle it uh, twofold. Uh, first, a look at, uh, in terms of uh, the financing uh, on the domestic financing front, uh, whereby, um, whereby even the 
the bonds that are being issued, even the prospectors for these months are primary bond issuance. It's all, it's, it's a bit generic. It's telling us that uh, the use of the proceeds, bond proceeds will go to <clears throat> budget support. But we know that there's a, there's a bond that is maturing at the same time that this bond will be issued. issued uh, there's an FXD1 2015-5, which is a first five-year paper that was issued in 15, uh, 2015 that will be maturing uh, next week on Monday. Uh, it has an outstanding amount of 30 billion. So the amount that is being sought in this primary bond issue is 40 billion. So it's a no-brainer that most of the bond proceeds from this month's uh, bond sale will go towards retiring that bond. So that's one. And it also cuts across even the infrastructure bond uh, teasers that are being issued for it, I think the last two years, whereby we've moved from a point whereby it was a bit indicative that uh, the use of the bonds or bond proceeds will go towards particular sectors, be it roads, be it water, be it energy. But right now, even that is not being put forward. So it's a bit uh, difficult even to see the beneficiary projects. I remember some point must have been at the beginning of uh, this year, sometime the beginning of this year when the 2020 budget policy statement was being uh, debated in parliament and some of the recommendations that came from the relevant committee, that the budget appropriation committee. And it was to the effect that there should be a list of beneficiary projects that should benefit from the funds that come, that should be funded. But on a domestic financing perspective, as far as, as far as I know, that list has not been publicized. If at all, it's been published. So that's, an, that's quite key. Uh, looking at the foreign financing uh, bit, yes, there's, uh, there's usually a list of uh, donors, and the amount that they'll be able to fund in any given financial year. But I drill down into the specific projects that has not been forthcoming. Uh, the quarterly economic budgetary review uh, told us uh, what came out from that is that uh, there is uh, 8 billion that was uh, project loans, and then there's another 16 billion that was project appropriation loans. But the exact projects that benefited in that particular quarter that has not been forthcoming. So I think that's an uh, area that there should be some advocacy, not only from the market participants, but the, uh, the, the wider public spectrum, at least to ensure that there's some transparency or there's some openness towards the beneficiary projects. Uh, back to you, Damaris. Okay, thanks so much, Churchill. I don't mind taking over, but yes, over to Gerald. <laughs> okay, thank you, Damaris. Thank you, Ian, for your question. Um, I would try to strike a balance between uh, growth and value uh, strategies. I think uh, looking at our current market, almost every stock is trading at, at a discount to a historical um, average uh, valuation. Eh? If you look at uh, price to book, for example, for the banking sector has come off substantially. If you look at uh, price to earnings ratio for most of the other uh, companies, they're also trading at a significant discount to their historical averages. If you look at uh, you know price to cash flow, for example, for uh, most of the other companies, they're also quite, uh, quite depressed to where the historic have been. So almost every company currently is trading at, at a, you know, uh, at a, you could employ a value strategy to almost every company, every every stock that is currently trading. I think for the growth uh, for the growth stocks, yeah, they, you usually tend to uh, to trade at a premium to their to their averages and even to to the sector generally. And you see some stocks like Safaricom that you know has has basically defied the the COVID pandemic and is trading at an almost uh, all time high. So try to strike a balance between value and uh, value and growth, uh, considering also that when you look at value, in the traditional sense of uh, value investing strategies, they tend, these are stocks that tend to be a bit uh, slow in terms of realizing their full, uh, full pricing. But growth stocks tends to be a bit uh, quite fast, uh, and uh, you could easily realize a capital gain uh, from those stocks. So back to Damaris. 
Okay, thank you so much, Gerald and Ian. I trust you've gotten uh, the response to your question. Um, there's been a lot of issues, okay, not a lot of issues. There's been a lot of requests raised on chat for the FX Pesa training link, as well as how to onboard. So different participants have asked for this information. We'll include it in the thank you email you'll receive by Wednesday. So you'll receive these two links. And if you're interested, you can go ahead and register for the trainings or also open up a live or a demo account. Matthew, I know you're ready to tackle these questions and there have been a significant number that have come uh, since you've been gone. So I know you left it at the Great British Pound and Japanese yep. Yang pairing, but we also had Peter Waititu who's asking, does a high leverage affect a trade negatively as long as you, you are keen on stop loss provision, stop loss and position size? And I also have Ian back with another question. He says, he sees screenshots of buys in which a buy on the dip and a sell when the price uh, rises. How do people make money on sales? So we could tackle those three questions and then come back for another set. All right, that's really awesome. I, I feel good engaging with you people. So um, going on EK's question about the pound Japanese yen, if I can just share my screen. Just check on it. So this is on a four hour chart. And um, looking keenly, we can see that this is on an uptrend according to these trend lines that we have here and it's trading above the moving averages, above the 200 moving averages. And now we had a level here, very important. It's like it broke that level, now getting a support around that level. If you can just zoom in a little bit. But before that, you can see it's just getting into a wedge, kind of, since the November highs, right, at this level here, where we had um, it going up to 147.792. All right, so currently trading above the moving averages and of course coming back to test this level. So we, we, we're likely to keep watching on what's, uh, what's on, of course, the news about um, the coronavirus cases, but because that's what's really affecting uh, the European side, right? And again, keep watching on the Wednesday 18th. We want to hear how. Um, the consumer price index will be on the pound. That's something that's likely to cause volatility, right? That, that's on the pound end. But currently, bullish, it has, it has tested on those levels. Now it's um, trying to test this uh, 137, 750 level, of course, bouncing above it right now. If it, if it just breaches um, the previous highs of around 138, 139 might go again to test on the, so the weekly on the 11th high, 11th November highs of, um, the today's highs of um, 140, something like that. So that, those are the insights. So keep checking on the news. And of course the fundamentals support uh, uh, seems like might be having uh, a likelihood of an uptrend, but again, Keep watching on that. Um, on the other side, let me stop sharing. The other side about uh, buying on dips, selling on highs, that is uh, the difference between when you're trading with the stocks, the, the local stocks that we have here on the NSE and what Churchill and Jared are talking about. Of course, you have to buy on the dips. It means you're buying when the prices are lower and you're expecting the value to appreciate over time so that when you get the profits, you you you, you just book in. That's the same way that you would be trading on the Forex side. But now, uh, specifically on the Forex, you can as well sell on highs. That, that one means that when you're expecting the, 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 the stocks or the financial instruments to depreciate in value, you can take advantage and sell. Because what you're looking at in Forex trading is just the changes in value of the derived, it's a derived value of the underlying asset, right? It, they are derivatives mostly. So I think we could there. And um, about leverage and stop loss. So remember stop loss, stop loss, you're going to use it to cap the losses. And again, you won't be changing leverage every now and then. You, you might be able to change a leverage within 24 hours, but not every time that you want. So maybe once in 24 hours. But now what you can play around with is the 
is the lot sizes, right? Calculate the amount of lots or the contract value that is um, in line with the amount of uh, risk that you're taking per trade. And I give an example. If you have $100, for example, in your account, I'm just giving an example. If you are risking 2% of your account, that is two out of 100 times 100 is $2. So if you decide that in every trade, you don't want to lose more than $2, then, and uh, you check on the markets and um, there is that space that, you, that is in between your entry and the exit or your stop loss. So the amount of pips there should be equal to what you're risking if it's $2. All right, so that's where you need to calculate the amount of lot size that is, uh, is, is going to allow your trade to play within that range and not expose you to a higher risk. So leverage has an effect there, but um, you're going to regulate that one or control that one using the lot size or position sizing. I hope I've answered that. You Absolutely. have, Matthew. And is it safe to assume that these concepts are some of the things you cover in the trainings that are being provided? Yeah, yeah. These are things that we will cover on the how to form your trading, trading strategies class and um, even A to Z and even on the pre-recorded sessions that we have. There are things that we've highlighted there about risk reward okay. ratio and, and risk management. All those things are fair. But we'll always be happy to address ah. them here as they come and... Um, Welcome with the questions. Okay, okay that's great. Uh, and I also like where you've directed people to pre-existing uh, resources. You don't just have to wait for the trainings. You can check out FX Pesa's uh, YouTube channel and you'll find recordings of these different uh, trainings. Um, Matthew, I believe our final question for you for today is from Ken Juguna. He asks if there's a minimum deposit to start FX trading using um, the, the platform we've been discussing. Good question. This is a question we get most oftenly whenever we're engaging with people. And of course, it's very important because when you're starting to, to invest, you need to understand the environment. So uh, I always say that just like you would go to stocks and um, invest the amount you would want, there's someone who will be buying maybe uh, 10,000 shares or even thereabouts or whichever amount you want to, 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 to invest with. So in Forex trading, you need to of course, depending on how much you, what you're looking at in terms of how, how much you want to be getting into profits and your trading strategy, you decide how much you want to deposit into your account. But again, uh, you can deposit uh, maybe a thousand. I don't want to quote a specific amount, but um, you can start low with a smaller capital. Again, very important. Don't start with too low capital that you yourself don't appear uh, serious, right? So you want to start it as a business that you're starting, looking up to how much am I willing to earn and am I seriously doing this? So that you start with something substantial and you put in, when you start with something substantial, it will call your attention. You put in the required uh, uh, risk management and the required education. So about the minimum, you really set it yourself based on what I've just talked about. And um, I can right, see another question. I don't know whether I can respond to it. Someone asking about my outlook on gold going forward, given the geopolitical political environment. Uh, with gold, it is um, considered a safe haven and a hedge against the inflation. All right, so currently, we are all waiting to hear about the stimulus and what might happen. And that one is likely, of course, if we have um, Biden getting in. But if, even before that, of course, the, the Senate and uh, the US government has been always speaking about that. So when stimulus comes in, remember that's likely to cause inflation. And when people want to hedge inflation, then um, we might see movements in the gold currently. It is trading, let me just check on the charts real quick. It's trading just at the, just below the 100 moving average, right? And uh, it's just at some form of consolidation. So when the stimulus gets in, and of course the uncertainty is on the US election because um, it's like Trump has not yet considered, he's still dealing with, um, in the elections mode and making the decision. So 
let, let's keep watch on the stimulus. That's going to give the moves on where the gold might move next. Okay. So we are watching the current environment to see if there's going to be a further upside in the gold market. Yeah. All right, Jeffrey, thank you so much uh, for that question. Uh, I'd like to wrap up the session with Joseph's question to Churchill. So Churchill, Joseph asks, are there any insights on the current status of Kenya's debt sustainability? That is debt versus the GDP ratio, ETC. I think that's a question that's always at the back of our mind. Uh, thanks, Joseph, for the question. Uh, looking at the public debt uh, numbers at the end of uh, the current numbers, that's at the end of September, 7.1 trillion. That's the overall uh, public debt. So you're looking at uh, as a percentage of GDP, that's roughly 7%. But of course, if you ask, uh, say, Treasury, what's the public debt as a percentage of GDP, they'll knock off some. Uh, uh, six percent total of that, uh, so it's coming to around six five percent. The reason is, uh, there's uh, <clears throat> like around 600 billion government deposits which is knocked off from the public debt. That's where the where treasury sits. Of course, this is all aesthetics, in my opinion. Uh, the, the overall public debt needs to be the total debt stock at 7.1 trillion as a percentage of GDP. But having said that, the better metric, of course, which you have also raised in your question is what are the ratios, how are the ratios looking at? I'm looking at, uh, for instance, on the external debt, uh, it's good, it's a better starting point to look at where our FX reserves are. Uh, it's at around $8.1 billion, they about $810 billion, they about. And uh, the external debt servicing in the course of this year totals to around, uh, it was 200 billion for the financial year, but there's a 80 billion already had been expensed in the first quarter. So that's 160 billion uh, that needs to be paid out uh, between September, October rather, up until June next year. So we service the FX reserves that is somehow stable. If you look at the state, uh, comparing uh, where Zambia is, of course, right now they are just nearing default. One of the things that undid them was uh, they had their FX reserves at around $1.1 billion, and then they had uh, external debt payments for three financial years to the tune of $1.5 billion each year. So already that was a trend wreck. From, from that perspective, you had this min, minimum FX reserves to fund out this huge uh, debt sub, external debt servicing. But comparing Kenya and Zambia from that metric, at least we can say that it's much stable on that perspective. But having said that, uh, looking at even the trajectory of uh, public debt accumulation, uh, we, we, are, we are looking at one trillion uh, increase in public debt in this financial year alone. So that one will take us closer to 7.6 trillion as we started the financial year at 6.6 .6 trillion there about. So an increase of 1 trillion, that's taking us to 7.6 trillion, much closer to the 9 trillion limit. So of course that is a concern. And even looking at even uh, what a percentage of uh, the overall uh, debt servicing cost as a percentage of ordinary revenue, uh, we're looking at 59%. Uh, so for every 100 shillings that we collect from ordinary revenue, 59 shillings is going to service this debt. So already that is a, a time bomb waiting to happen. So those are some of the concerning uh, things that we are looking at from a public debt perspective. Uh, we, we were quite hopeful that uh, the Public Debt Management Office, there was a public debt borrowing uh, policy that now affected the Public Debt Management Office, at least to curtail uh, the, the increase in public debt stock. But so far, that hasn't uh, panned out as we had expected. So that is a concern, uh, even as much as uh, some of these other metrics particularly from the external debt, may be quite sustainable. It's just that the trajectory of uh, accumulating the debt is, is, is really concerning. I think let me just stop it here, back to you, Damaris. Thank you so much for that, Churchill. At what point do we get alarmed? Right now we are concerned. When do we get alarmed? 
we are alarmed at the same time concerned so we are just uh, moving moving along muddling along muddling along okay thank you so much churchill we definitely like reading your notes when it comes to the microeconomic uh environment and i'm sure that's when you will raise <laughs> your alarm so we've come to the end of our session and before we go i just wanted to give a brief recap for everyone who's in our session we had Gerald's sec uh, section on trading on the NSC and the stock. So I just wanted to emphasize if you are interested in trading in stocks, you, we have our Jacuzzi app. We like to sell our Jacuzzi app takes the guesswork out of investing. So if this is something you're interested in, it's as simple as downloading the app, registering and opening a share trading account using Jacuzzi app. And then you're able to trade with the help of our recommendations in our Genghis Weekly Cross Asset Strategy Reports. So Gerald and Churchill, every Monday by 6 a.m., you have a report sent to you on your email or in app of the Jacuzzi that gives you an outlook for the, for the week. It also has commentary on the global financial markets. We also have this investor briefings. The reason we have them on Monday is to give you sufficient time to enable yourself to action these recommendations. In addition, if you want to trade in treasury bills and bonds, we are one email or one message away. So you can reach out to a fixed income desk via the in-app chat or sending an email to info. And lastly, if you're interested in the FX market, we have the partnership with uh, FX Pesa and EGM Securities. I will be sharing the information and the link to the training platform as well as how you can onboard on the product. Thank you so much. It's been lovely having everyone in this session as always. I hope we'll see everyone next week for our penultimate edition for 2020. And thank you so much for being engaged in audience and thanks to Churchill, Gerald and Matthew. We'll see you guys next week.